Hi, uh, this is Angela Arden, and uh, welcome to Hollywood Stars, Articles, Stories, and More. And I am bringing you uh, another interview. And this is the one, I don't know if you saw an ad that I did recently for this channel, uh, but I, in the ad, um, I promised, which is a video that I created a, called um, What We're About, about this channel and another channel that I have called um, Angelina the Adventurer, um, and also um, where to find me on Instagram. And I'm going to post it on this channel if I haven't already. I will probably have posted it before I post this. The reason I'm mentioning all of this is that in it, I promise that I will do this interview next. And so I am keeping my word. The promise uh, was for the John Mayer interview uh, as uh, interviewed by the producer of uh, Saw Brock, Don Was, who was also the producer of John Mayer's um, one of his other albums uh, called Born and Raised, which is actually my very favorite album of John Mayer's. I like all of his albums uh, very much, uh, bordering on love. Probably love them. Okay, I love them. But the one that I love the most is um, Born and Raised. It has a uh, undeniable charm, as do both of the people that I... Uh, mentioned that are in fact um, generating the questions and generating the answers in this interview. Now this interview is from the very first uh, edition of Sob Rock Zine which is uh, volume 1 June 2021 which is a very special um thing to receive and there was a point in time it probably is still there where you could go on uh, to I think it's the John Mayer's official web site and um, register to receive the uh, to well just register and I did not I did that I did not know what uh, fortune it might bring and it brought me uh, I have volume one and volume two you might be able to still get volume Two, if you register, I do not know or promise that you will ever be able to receive volume one. Oh, no. Oh, no. It might be true. However, you will be able to receive, hopefully, I don't know. You know what? I make no promises. I make no guarantees. I don't even know if you can still register on his site. I do know that you can go there yourself and you can check and find out. I hope you do that. Okay, so let's dive in, shall we? Um, here we go. John Mayer and Don Was on the making of Saw Brock. Hey, John. Good to see you, man. I've missed you. We spent seven months in a bubble together. Can you describe the extraordinary circumstances under which we recorded Saw Brock? John Mayer. Good to see you. And I sure missed you, too. Well... These songs all came out pretty quickly during the pandemic. I'd say around April until June. I tend to write in these concentrated little trances. And when I knew I had an album's worth of material, I thought it was the perfect time to make a record. Seeing as there wasn't anything else to do that could be nearly as constructive, I remember thinking... I need Don to help me on this one because you have this way of keeping me from feeling lost or helpless as I'm putting an album together. The way I think about it is that you sort of let me tether myself to your creativity and then I can be free to dream really big without feeling like the whole thing is a waste of time. Which you know as an artist that feeling can creep in pretty quickly with little provocation. And so we set off to make this record, thinking that we'd throw each song on the table, record it in a few days, and move on to the next. 
which is always a big mistake when it comes to how I work. He laughs. Because the record just kept getting bigger and deeper and wider and more dense as we went. Dawn. The lack of a deadline and absence of distractions were definitely once-in-a-lifetime bonuses. I saw you dig in and devote weeks to making each track better and better. Let's talk about how the luxury of unlimited time made this a better record. John, not just the luxury of unlimited time, which I suppose I've had for a while now when making records, but the luxury of unbroken time. We were sort of sequestered like jurors, not taking in any outside cultural or social distractions. Because, as we know, there weren't any. It was home, studio, home, studio, with almost zero deviations from that for months on end. And that allowed us to all see the same picture in sync. And nobody came in after a week in New York or some other pause in the action that would make us come in and contradict ourselves with a new idea. This record is one idea, executed in one place, in one time, with one shared vision, and you can really hear and feel it on the album. Dawn, our little bubble at Henson Studios was extremely relaxed and comfortable. However, there was an inescapable overtone of pandemic anxiety and fear that we shared with everyone on the planet. It was an odd contrast. How do you think it impacted the music? John, I think we all made a record that was less about any real finish line. Nobody was waiting on it to get turned in so we could book a tour and more about building a dream world. We could visit by pulling a song up, enjoying the music, and finding new ways to add more color and depth to it. We were making a record so that we had a place to go, both physically and emotionally. If you stopped the music and walked outside, you had nothing. Just fear and silence and unknown. The music became our little clubhouse. And I can hear that when I listen back now. It's insanely special. Don, the tracks operate on a couple of different levels. I think the thing that listeners will notice first is a certain fascination with the musical textures of the 1980s. That's probably most evident on the first single, Last Train Home. It certainly goes against the grain of current trends in popular music. What's that all about? Well, as much as I would like to take some stand on it not being an 80s album, and maybe I could if I tried. Salt Rock is somewhat of a period piece. I thought a lot about Quentin Tarantino as I made this record, where it's about stoking a real love affair with a time and a feeling, and wanting to create more supposed reality from the time. And the pandemic gave me that blank canvas to pick a time and place to take shelter in as a form of self-soothing. Time and place ceased to be for an entire year. Why not pick your favorite to hide out in and find ways to laugh and smile and possibly feel like you're making a little mischief and really, quite honestly, Make the art that you dreamed of making when you were a kid. That's the joy of being an artist, that you can make old dreams come true whenever you want. For all my wishing, I was a famous musician in 1988. I got to pretend 
I was me then, but now. Or maybe me now, but then. As for going against the grain of trends, you know, I spent so long missing the trends that I figured I might as well take advantage of the freedom here. Nobody's expecting me to do anything in particular, and that's actually the ultimate place to be as an artist. I just want to say right now that um, when uh, the pandemic started in March of 2020, um, John Mayer, if you followed him on Instagram at that time, he was really, as I did and a lot of uh, fans did, he was really there. Not that I consider myself a fan. I consider myself an enthusiast, and there is a difference, and perhaps I'll go into that one day. But um, uh, it falls under, I guess, some people are more comfortable with uh, the close neighborhood of uh, fandom. Um, I remember when that pandemic started, and I remember... John Mayer had a uh, an Instagram TV show called Current Mood. If you haven't seen it, check it out. You can find it on YouTube. You can find all of the episodes, in fact, on YouTube. But he did a special series, and I don't know if it was just two or a few shows called The Gentle Hours. And the only one that I really remember of those three, two or three, The Gentle Hours was the first one because that one was the one that told us that John was going through what each and every one of us was going through too. He was hunkering down for the first time because the pandemic had just started and he was comforting us. He gave us really good advice like dress for each day just because you're going to be at home don't stop dressing for the day put your bed clothes on before you go to bed and have an evening and do the same thing the next day and this is going to help keep you sane and keep anxiety as low as it can be during a time like this even now because um, on this day when we are going through uh, another uh, round of this with uh, the Delta uh, variant and um, ready to get our booster shots in um, one to three months, depending on whether you got uh, Pfizer or Moderna um, and, or Johnson and Johnson, um, this advice still works. So I hope you check it out. Just uh, look up. The Gentle Hours, Current Mood, John Mayer, or rather, I guess it would be Current Mood, John Mayer, The Gentle Hours. And then you want to listen to the first episode of that. And that is where uh, this um, true world um, comforting advice is. And now back to the interview. Underneath, this is Don, uh, was... Uh, speaking his question, his next question. Underneath those textures, the songwriting hits a new plateau in your continuity, evolving maturity and sophistication as an art. The bulk of these songs were written in a relatively short period in 2020, which is astounding. Let's talk about how that came about. John, I didn't play music for a couple of months after lockdown began. I just didn't know what my feelings sounded like. You know, we make music because we want to express how we feel in contrast with what the world feels like. There's so much relativity there between artist and world. Loneliness as a song idea is always tactically compared to the rest of the world's seemingly buzzing around, making things happen. Nobody was making anything happen, so 
the entire game board shifted. It, if there's no we, there's no me as a writer. Until at some point that silence and the blackness sent me deep into myself. Not as a famous dude making his eighth record, but as a guy just looking inward. And eighth is in parentheses, John just said, making his record. There was a fair bit of the mechanics of grief at play, you know? You just start watching reels of your life go by, watching these scenes play out and taking real note of them. And so each song kind of encouraged me to write the next. I can't quite explain that trance. But it's like you can tell from each song what the next needs to be to complete it. And by July, I had every song mapped out. I flew to L.A. from Montana with these songs mostly finished, all except for some finished lyrics on a couple of songs. Dawn. The album holds together as an integrally unified piece rather than being just a collection of singles. Are there some central themes that underscore this music? John. Well, I think the biggest reason it holds together like it does is because I didn't play that game I usually do where I get 10 or 12 songs and then try to keep writing to knock the weak ones out. I remember doing that on The Search for Everything, and though I love the songs on that album, you can hear the different life phases and intentions beating against one another. This was about lock the 10 vignettes and that's your movie. Want more? Make another movie. <laughs> I have to tell you, that's the way to do it. What you hear is a straight shot from idea to fruition, and you can feel it when you listen. Dawn. One of the rawest and most poignant songs on the album is Why You Know Love Me. I must admit that when I first heard your demo, I was a bit thrown by the hook line's adverb situation. I totally get it now and am in awe of the incredible beauty of the writing, but it took a minute to get used to that line. Would you like people to know about this song? John, it's funny. I would say by the fifth time I heard it back, when I I first wrote it as a demo, the words sounded right to me. They've sounded right to me ever since. Those words in that order, that's about getting hurt so deep that it hits you right in the kid, where you can't even form sentences correctly. And an aside here is, um, I I think he would mean to add, if like when you were a kid and you were learning how to speak English, how to talk, and you progressed, you know, you'd say, um, you, you say you're 12, and you'd say, you knew, you knew how to say the sentence, you knew it was, you know, why do you feel the need to hurt me, you know, but when you get hurt, uh, you'd, it, you'd say, you would say, why, you know, love me, you know, you would revert back to that little three or four year old, and it's kind of like um, if anybody ever said, uh, I feel a scared, you know? You, you're trying to say the, the word that you learned later on in school, which is afraid. But that little kid is scared. So they want to say scared. And that's why you end up saying a scared. I'm a scared. And it's the same. It's, I think it's that same thing that the brain does that he is clearly, um, you know, uh, writing about in this song. So I think that was my second aside. See what I do? Now back to John. To me, the saddest part of it is that it's wrapped up in a soft rock banger. It makes me laugh because the two emotions ram up against each other, and I don't know whether to cry or sway to it. So I just laugh. And I would say he means out of the confusion of it. 
Because the emotional mix is so odd, he said. Because the emotional mix is so odd. So that's why it caused um, a new sensation in him that he wasn't, that he wasn't uh, used to. And so there was no way he was going to change the words of that song. And I think that is extremely, absolutely cool. Don was. I think my favorite song on the album is Shouldn't Matter But It Does. And I'm not too proud to admit that I started crying while we were recording it. Tell us a bit about that one. John. I had that song written in my head before I actually recorded it. It was my shower song for several months. I'd just write the parts and remember the structure in my head. Maybe I wrote a few lines down in the iPhone, but it really was the only song I kind of worked out before ever singing it. It's about being a grown-up man. I can't quite explain it. It's what's left after you clean everything up you can from the pain of lost love. It's all about that stuff that you can't totally clear away and how you just deal with the remains, which in its own right is sad. The sad, unfun truth. Don was, Shot in the Dark, was a song that we wrestled with a bit. I think we're both thrilled with the way it came out. What made it more difficult to capture than the others? John Mayer. A bit? <laughs> Laughs. You know, I still don't know why it was so hard to get that song down the way I heard it in my head. Everything else on the album, to a certain extent, was point and shoot. Even if we had to try a few times to get there. But Shot in the Dark took us both for a real ride. I think there was some musicological aspect of that song that made it tough to get right. But also, man, sometimes you just have an impossible dream for a song. You have an idea for a scene in a movie that you just can't shoot in a practical way. But I'm so happy to say that all we had to do was try our best, stay true to what the song wanted, and once it was mixed and mastered and I gave it a month or so, it's one of my favorite songs on the album. All I had to do was listen to what was there and forget what I had in mind. That happens sometimes. It won't be the last time, unfortunately. You just have to make the record. Just follow your heart and take your head out of things sometimes. Doing that allowed me to have this song, which I'm so happy about. Don was. Three of the songs were previously released as singles. We did some extra work on Carry Me Away, though. Why not just include it as it originally was? John Mayer. Carry Me Away, and I can say this now, made my bones itch to have released as it was. I'm not too proud to say that I felt like, before that song even came out, it didn't have enough of the rocket fuel a track needs to get somewhere in the world. And that was completely my fault. I remember being on tour and experimenting with the idea of making a song as a two-week summer vacation project, which I did. And I had a blast because I really caught a beautiful tune in the process but it just wasn't fully fleshed out. When it came time to make this album, I knew I could take that extra time I needed to make it great. And listening to it now is a remarkable experience. My shoulders drop. I get totally into the music and I go, there it is. 
same song, but it comes to you where you sit now. Instead of you listening forward in your chair to find it. I always knew that song was in there, and now everyone can hear it. Don was. Let's talk about the way we recorded the album. The band was playing live in a room while you played guitar and sang. That's becoming an increasingly rare methodology these days. What are the benefits of recording that way as opposed to overdubbing an instrument at a time? John Mayer. Well, the best part is that it's where you do your finest work. Laughs. Laughs. Nothing is better than all playing as a band and you're there in the live room with your shoes off, sitting in a chair with the headphones on, and you're strolling around in each take of the song. Nothing. Nobody will quite understand what you bring to a song unless they were to see you do it. It's lovely. You inhabit the music along with the musicians, and when the take is over, you give your report on what you saw and how you felt, and it's always right. Don was. You put together an incredible group of musicians, many of whom are becoming a true repertory company for you. Tell us about them. John Mayer. Well, I've been lucky enough to have met and played with some of the best musicians on earth. And I can't tell you how good that feels as a writer to know that there's no musical idea that can't be played to perfection by assembling a certain crew from the world around me. Again, I'll hit you with the movie director analogy. There's no scene I can write that I don't already know the best actors to be in. And that sense of freedom is priceless. Having Aaron Sterling and Sean Hurley back in the fold was a treat. We all worked together on Born and Raised and Paradise Valley, and I knew that was the gang for these songs. And then, and here comes the Tarantino reference again, seeing as it was a love letter to a certain musical intention as far as the production went, I wanted to find the guys that made some of that legendary music from decades past. And that included Greg Fillingaines and Lenny Castro. Marion Morris is on a few songs as well. I just think she's as true a musician as they come. I'm incredibly lucky to know her, and I was thrilled that she wanted to be a part of this album. And then to have guys like Larry Golding's Keys and Greg Lay's Pedal Steel in the mix, there just isn't a musical idea they can't bring to life, even better than I'd imagined. Don was... There was a period just after Christmas and before the vaccine was available to us when there was a spike in new cases of COVID. Going to the studio was deemed to be too risky, so we set up a control room in a tent in your backyard and finished the album in there. I've been making records for 40 years, and that was a first. How did you feel about that? John Mayer, I think that was the perfect ending to making Sob Rock. We'd all looked out for each other so many months that even when it became too dangerous to even go into the studio, we saw it through up here at my house. I sang the vocals for Wild Blue in my bedroom. That line about, quote, on a bed of gray, unquote, Question mark. That's from me looking over at my bed with a gray comforter on it. We saw it through. This record began with a vision. It came to life every day as 
a way to soothe ourselves and find some respite from so much fear and negativity and ending on the loudest, clearest note of adapt and improvise I could think of. You know, in some ways, this album was like the albums young bands make, where all they have is each other. It's all we had. We had each other. And we met inside the music. Dawn, I saw you bleed over every detail of this record. You put your heart and soul into every note and every syllable. I've actually never seen an artist go that deep and care so much. How do you feel when you hear the finished album? John Mayer. Well, thank you. I saw you go to the ends of sanity a few times and never complain. And I won't forget that as long as I live. I can say that you and I have both been to the brink of knowing what to do next with all of your credits and all the records I've made. We both bonded so deeply in that place of not knowing where the next step could lead us, which is why it's so special when I hear it back. We found new ground together. And if I'd never found any new ground again, I'd have counted my blessings and been happy. I have the songs I do. But we found new places to play, and that's what I hear. I hear music that I never thought I could have made a year ago. I guess what I'm saying is, I can't believe I get to say it's mine. Hmm. Don was... Oh, yeah. One other thing. Why did you call the album Saw Brock? John Mayer. Lots of little reasons. But the one I feel like explaining at the moment is that if you were to average out the names of my past albums and suppose the name of the next one I put out, Saw Brock throws it way out of whack. And that just tickles me and makes me feel like maybe there is a lot more new ground to go looking for from here. Okay, well, that is the end of uh, Don Was' interview of John Mayer uh, for the album that uh, Don Was produced, John Mayer's Sob Rock. Well, that is the end of the interview. And that is the end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you liked the interview. And join me next time for another article, interview, or story. And until then, this is Angela Arden, hoping that you make yourself the star of your own life. If you like this, please subscribe and, of course, uh, hit that thumbs up and like it. And most of all, just come back and let's do this again. Bye for now.